This is a place to grow because that's what you need. It's what your wife needs, it's what your church needs, your neighborhood, your kids, and your work. Let's build something good and take the challenges of life head on together. It's time to be physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. If that's what you're looking for, I'm glad you're here. This is Culture Builder. Welcome to the show. My name is Luke Zedwick, and this is Culture Builders, where we try to build something good. Uh, today, I want to start by talking about parenting. And I want to start with a concept that I learned as a teacher, but that I apply at home. And that I think is going to apply to a bunch of areas today, but we're going to start with applying it to parenting. Here's how it goes. Um, I used to make this hand gesture when I would find myself frustrated with the kids. It goes like this, and it says... The more uh, chaos, the more rules. The less chaos, the less rules. And as a young teacher, I found myself wishing or thinking, I think idealistically, that I would have the same rules in every class. <clears throat> but it became clear pretty quickly that different classes needed different rules based on the personality of the group. And often that personality was highly influenced by two or three kids who had it in their mind that they wanted to be in control of my class. And so, when that chaos would increase, um, the rules had to increase. They had to change. It had to become more strict. But I always had it in mind and made clear to them, my students, and I do this with my sons now too, that the goal is that they would control themselves, that they would make their own decisions. And so even though I might be increasing the rules, I was gonna only do that for a time, and then I would bring it back down because collaboration is what I'm aiming for. And I was training them to collaborate and also to resist the part of them that gets in the way of true teamwork and collaboration, and that would be the chaotic, self-centered, short-sighted part that we all have. So I wanna give you permission, parents, uh, to increase the rules, to do it openly, and to express the frustration that you're feeling to your kids, but also do it with a plan. Not just, that's it, we're gonna make rules that you yourself will forget about or forget to enforce or get lazy about in the coming weeks, but set specific boundaries with a plan to move them back out as the kids show themselves to be capable of handling more freedom. Uh, an example of that, recently, and I told you about this last session, uh, we implemented a schedule in our house, and I purposefully left the definition of learning time, because remember, they're only in part-time school right now, and that part-time school is uh, not sufficient for their education. So I scheduled for them an 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock learning time, and they immediately want to know what does that mean and I told them that they needed to propose to me what they wanted it to mean. So I'm in building in less free time, but also more choice and a possible negotiation they can have with me about what they want that time to include. So all of that was based on the fact that I kept teaching, catching them uh, mindlessly wasting hours of their day on their Chromebooks when they were supposed to be doing schoolwork, but instead were watching nonsense on YouTube, or some other thing. So, be strategic, be open, and when the chaos increases, increase the rules, but with a plan for the future. So, let's talk about teaching, because that definitely would work in the sense of teaching. But there's something else I wanted to bring up, something I read this week about uh, a fighter jet, of all things. Uh, I happen to have a, a curiosity around fighter jets. I've read, and one of my favorite biographies is of uh, a, a Colonel Boyd, who was influential in the 70s and 80s in the design of fighter jets. He and his uh, friends, acolytes they were called, uh, came to be known as the fighter mafia in the Pentagon in the 80s and 90s. And they were uh, persistent in designing fighter jets to one purpose, that each jet would have its own purpose and therefore it would be the best because it would be designed around that one aim, whether it was a fighter jet or it was a bomber or something else. I bring that up because the F-35 was in the news this week for having uh, failed. 
they basically declared that there were so complex, so many features in this fighter jet that it couldn't do any of the things that they promised it would do. You see, what they promised when they designed it, I think it was Lockheed Martin, they promised it would replace all the other jets. It would be an air-to-air -air combat fighter. It would be a ground assault uh, coverage uh, like the A-10 Warthog. It would be a long-range bomber. It would do all those things because technology. And the reality is it simply can't. And neither can you. Teachers, you will always have administrators. You will always have parents who want to give you one more thing, one more feature to be taught in your class, to be covered by technology. You can't do it. You have to learn to resist the impulse that's from without and from within to always be adding one more thing to teach and in the process lose that quality that you are so needed for. Stick to those fundamentals, stick to your guns if you have a place of influence, but realize the state is always going to give you more standards than you're able to fulfill. They're always going to give you more features in that textbook than you're able to use. And if you try to do all the things all the time, you'll be terrible at everything. So get focused and get those values set of what it is you care about and why you became a teacher and then stick to it. You can do it. It's good work and worth doing. So let's talk about those leaders, uh, those leaders who want to keep adding things, the leaders who are uh, thinking that with the, the right technology, they can outsmart reality. Um, and I want to give you a tip, leaders, whether that's you or not, I want to give you a tip about how to bring out the best in the people you work with. And that is, and I, there might even be a book by this title, I think, Leaders Speak Last. And I want to encourage you that this is really true. I want you to be aware of what it is you say in whether it's a meeting environment or in one-to-one -one conversations. That if you find yourself as a leader being the one who's doing what I'm doing, right? Doing all the talking and none of the listening. The person who always has all the answers or and thinks that you have to, which for a long time as a leader, I thought that's what I had to do. It's the wrong way. And it brings, it, it shuts people up. People who look to you think, well, you have the answer. So I don't need to share my perspective either because they think they're not smart enough. Maybe they look up to you or because they think you're not going to care because you always have something to say. And so I want to challenge you to speak last, to give your opinion last, to draw thoughts and perspectives out of the people that work with you and work for you so that you will find the best solutions because you're going to find that even if you're the smartest person in the room, the combined intellect of all the other people will still surpass you. You have to draw from the collective internet, <laughs> internet, intellect. You have to draw from the collective intellect uh, of the group of people you work with because their diverse ways of thinking is an asset. If you all have the same personality and the same perspective on things, uh, it'd be a deficit. Yeah, because you have blind spots. So learn how to coach those people because that's your job as a leader is to get the most people engaged in the process, not just telling everybody what to do. But you know that. All right, I want to pause right now and go back to parents for a second. If you or someone you know is looking for some more perspective on parenting, I wrote a book. I want to advertise it right now that uh, I think it's worth your time to get it to read it. It's called Problem Solvers and Educators Insights for Raising Kids on Purpose. And it's for sale on Amazon or there's a link on my website, lukezedwick.com. Check it out. And if any of this content whether in this session or others, has been helpful to you, I would encourage you to subscribe, to share, to follow, to do the things. Uh, I'm not only posting these on YouTube, but they will be available on Facebook. You can search and friend request me at Luke Zedwick on Facebook, and also uh, on Twitter, at Mr. Zedwick, M-R-Z-E-D-W-I-C-K. That's Mr. Zedwick on Twitter, and Luke Zedwick everywhere else. Maybe I should get that Twitter Luke Zedwick too. It could just make everything flow together. 
All right, I have a couple more things I want to pause. I want to talk about culture, as we always do. And in this case, art. Last session, I talked about all, how art is the intersection of your body, your mind, and your spirit. And I think that's definitely true. And the more I've reflected on that this week, the more I was, it struck me that every art form is a religious expression. And I was thinking about a time when I went to church with someone of a different religion. I didn't go there because I thought of joining their religion, but because I wanted to learn from them. Because even if someone is of a different religion than me, and I genuinely think that that religion is in error, because otherwise I would join their church, right? It doesn't mean that they're not sincerely searching for truth and insights into what makes the world a better place. And so there's something to be learned from those people. But here's what I did. When I went to that church, I had my, um, how would you say it? I had my armor on. I wanted to be aware of the fact that this was not my religion, that this was not my belief structure. In fact, that I believe there are lies that these people have believed that have led them away from the true religion. And anyone who's truly religious would think the same way. But in that way, I wanted to be cautious that I wasn't also drawn into those lies. And the fact is, is that there's environments like that that we fall into every day, every time we are exposed to art. Because all forms of real art, actually even forms of bad or fake art, like propaganda, is expressing a religion. It's expressing a, simps, a system of beliefs and morals that try to describe the universe in all the mysterious ways that we can't see. And so, some religions are true and others are false. And if you are exposed to false religion, you would keep your senses sharp. You would keep your wits about you. And I want to encourage you to do that every time you're exposed to any art form, be it music, television, movies, paintings, or any other form of art or expression where someone is putting their whole self into it. I'm thoroughly convinced that building houses and, and furniture and cars and all those things are an expression of art if they're done with your whole self. But every time they are, you're expressing the deepest part of you that includes the parts of you that are in error. And we all have those parts. We all have parts of us that are believing a lie. Do we all? Do we all have that? I think so. I mean, no one is perfect, right? Are, this is a good question, are the imperfections in each of us always an expression of a lie? I'm not sure. Maybe that's a good question for next time. All right, I want to leave you with a quote, something I've been thinking about. Uh, this is a quote from me about socialism. I've been in debates with lots of people lately, inclu including some really close friends, about what socialism is and how it creeps into communism as its end goal, according to those who originated the ideas, about uh, drawing a community together to support those in need. I mean, that's what good communities do. And what's the difference between that and a massive global system of controlling wealth and, and media and influence, which is what politics has become. It's not community. America is not a community, and America's culture is disintegrating in our midst. In fact, that's why I started this channel, is to encourage you to be a culture builder, because our culture has been destroyed, and we have to rebuild it. All right, so here's the quote. There are only two kinds of socialists. People who can't make it in a competitive world, and people who already have. The rich kids and the beta males, united to stop people from winning in life, trying to make the world into an oversized daycare full of staff who don't care, replacing the parents who sold their soul chasing status instead of growth. Don't join the race, build something good. My name is Luke and this is Culture Builders. I hope it helps. Take care.